So today I want to speak to you about change, specifically leveraging change. I'd have to tell you, they made me play that under duress. I was in this band a long time ago called Wild Cherry, play that funky music, White Boy. It was a big hit in the 70s. Oh. Thank you. Except you're playing right into my hands because the point of me playing that is that I really didn't have all that much to do with that record as far as I'm concerned. I was in the band, but I was in a way lucky. And luck's a part of life. I put myself in a position to get lucky. I had played music all my life as a keyboardist. Uh, I learned how to make records. But nevertheless, I was lucky. I had a lot to do with this next band called Donny Iris and the Cruisers, which I founded as a vehicle for me to write songs and produce records. And the first hit song I wrote for Donny Iris and the Cruisers was Alia. Then I experienced some bad luck and some change that would lead to a career change for me. I got sued. It seemed like a bad thing at the time, but in retrospect, maybe it was the best thing that could have happened to me. I received a summons and complaint for copyright infringement. Somebody claimed that I copied, Ali, uh, copied his song to create Alia, which I didn't. I never heard his song until the trial. My lawyer said, give the guy $25,000 to go away and I wouldn't, Donnie and I won at a jury trial. However, it was a Pyrrhic victory because the trial cost about $150,000, and that was way more than the song made. So I had my royalties, royalties recouped for many years, and I overreacted. I went to law school. <laughs> I had this idea that I could defend other people facing meritless infringement suits like I just endured. I felt very vulnerable that anyone could sue anybody for anything. So now I'm a lawyer as well as a musician, and I'm glad I'm a lawyer. So what seemed like a bad thing at the time was actually a good thing. Now, shortly after I began practicing law, I encountered another big change because I was practicing in the entertainment space because of this, the internet. File sharing took a big drop out of music sales. They fell. Music companies laid off employees. Now, when the CD was first invented, the music labels celebrated because they could engage in their favorite pastime, which was selling the very same product, the very same album to you all over again because of a format change. But what the labels didn't appreciate was that the unprotected CD and the internet and MP3 compression technology formed a perfect storm that would decimate their business. The music labels and the publishers fought back. And the law was on their side, too. File sharing music without permission was against the law, but it didn't matter. The people wanted to do it. The music labels sued everyone, right, to make it stop. They were enforcing the law, but all they did was alienate their market. What the labels were really fighting was the technology itself. And that's not a great strategy because technology always wins. What the labels should have been doing was leveraging the change, leveraging the technology, looking for a new opportunity that was there waiting for them. Now, other industries are experiencing change because of technology. Newspapers surely are, taxi drivers. Some companies have already gone through the change. You know, there are some in this room that don't know what Kodak is. And to them, I say that Kodak is a great company that at one time thought 
it was in the business of selling film for cameras. But it was really in the social expression business. And if Kodak had only realized that, if Kodak had only realized that it was in the social expression business, it might still be as relevant today as it was years ago. Perhaps with its powerful brand, it could have leveraged digital cameras when they were invented. But when digital cameras were inv invented, Kodak sold a lot of film. Now I have a friend and an entrepreneur and a client. He starts companies and he sells them for a lot of money. And I ask him how you do it. He said he inserts himself into markets being disrupted away from the status quo. He finds an inflection point and then he provides a solution. Well, that's exactly what Steve Jobs did when the music industry was disrupted and Daniel Eck. Major League Baseball leveraged technological change. MLB makes more money than ever from radio and television revenue, right? But at the time that the radio was first invented, Major League Baseball was afraid that nobody would ever go to the ballpark again to watch a live baseball game. But of course, it turned out fine. The motion picture industry has leveraged technological chain, change, though Jack Valenti, one time president of the Motion Picture Association, likened the original Sony Betamax video cassette machine to the Boston Strangler. Notice the fear. Because he was convinced that nobody would ever go to the theater again if people could tape shows in the home, if they could watch movies in the home. But of course, it turned out fine. Now we go to the theater, we watch the movie, we stream the same movie over cable, we buy the DVD, and the Motion Picture Association makes more money than ever. And then the law has to change, to conform to the new technology, to the new ecosystem, as it were. Remember this, technology leads, the law follows. It's never the other way around. If that were the case, then the music industry could have sued file sharing out of existence. And in the case of the music industry, the Copyright Office last year issued a report recommending comprehensive reforms to the existing music licensing structure based on the internet age. So you see, the law is going to change, the technology isn't. And now the winds of change are blowing again. 3D printing, it is shifting my legal practice and the world we live in. Like the music industry, manufacturing will be more about selling digital code than physical things. If you need a part for a car, your mechanic will buy the file and print the part in his shop. Or he may scan the broken part and print that. Or he may find it on Pirate Bay and sometimes the original OEM manufacturer will never know and never get any money. We are moving from a model of mass production to production by the masses with a high level of customization. Sneakers and prosthetics that fit the body perfectly, printed in all sorts of materials, concrete, metal, biomaterials, food. One goal is to print out a fully functioning smartphone in years to come, electronics and all. If you need a kidney transplant in 15 years, Perhaps you will have your own kidney bioprinted for you. Whole houses, apartment buildings, office buildings printed last year with very large 3D printers. Biz Stone, a co-founder of Twitter, tweeted that Nike may be a pure software company in 10 years, that we will simply 3D print our sneakers. Technology leads, the law follows. This technology is going to force profound changes in commercial laws. Think about the ramifications for FAA regulations, FDA regulations, for product liability law, for intellectual property law. Gartner analysts predict $100 billion in annual intellectual property losses from 3D printing beginning in 2018. 
on-demand printing is going to reduce the need for large inventories, reducing warehousing costs. Amazon and UPS are already aware their businesses are going to change. UPS is handling this threat to its warehousing business in a proactive way. It's opened 3D printing hubs in Louisville and in Europe and recently in Singapore. This technology is going to disrupt many things. But inevitably, new businesses will be born, inserted into the markets, disrupted by 3D printing. Entrepreneurs, like my friend, will find the inflection points and provide solutions, and a new status quo, and new jobs will be created. Change. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, Sometimes it only seems bad, and it's the best thing that could have happened to us. Check this out. This is a patent I found for an early digital camera. It was filed in May of 1977, issued in December of 1978 to Kodak. Kodak had the knowledge and the power to leverage a digital camera and sell it in the late 70s. And I read that Kodak said to its two employees who invented it, that's cute, don't tell anyone about it. You can never put the technological genie back in the bottle once unleashed to preserve the old model. We all know we can't avoid change simply because we want to, whether it occurs in our personal lives or in our businesses. But we can look for the opportunity that exists as a result of that change, because that opportunity is there, waiting for a Steve Jobs or a Daniel Eck or my entrepreneur friend to discover it. We must think more like entrepreneurs, even in our personal lives, when confronting change Spitball solutions, socialize them, validate them, choose a conscience-driven solution that comports with your values and execute. We might as well embrace inevitable change because if it's inevitable, it's going to happen and we survive. What I am suggesting is that if we, if we more swiftly move to acceptance, and apply a value-based solution to the problem and attack it the way entrepreneurs attack market disruption with perseverance and a little good luck, we can thrive with change. Thank you.